Combustion has other problems. Uh, even if you don't want to do combustion, you're going to have to fight combustion in many places. If your engine has a problem, here you see a nice hole in a combustor. And also, if you have fires, you have to fight combustion. You need to understand how these things propagate, for example. There's a long list of uh, places where you get into problems with combustion. Uh, this is basically the world of combustion is split in two parts. People like me who are trying to get good combustion and the other people who try to have no combustion. All the people working in that field try to avoid combustion. But of course, you know, it's just not possible. For example, if you're flying in this aircraft, suddenly you are very interested in combustion science. You'd like to know what's going on. Uh, you know, the French had uh, this uh, rather uh, dramatic problems with combustion again here. And this is a typical problem where combustion science could have helped if we would have uh, included in the design of the aircraft. An example also of electrical safety, something which is not as known. Um, if you take a building or even your house, for example, and if you have a leak here of, of gas, this can happen. So you can have gas here mixed with air. So this thing can explode. Uh, usually, why does it explode? Well, it explodes because you get an electrical spark somewhere. For example, in the place where all you have all your electrical connections, you have what we call here an electrical box. And the problem is to design this electrical box so that if there is a mixture here, and if you ignite it because there is a spark, the flame will stay within this box and will not ignite the whole building. There are lots of people working on that. And uh, so you have many solutions. One solution, for example, is to design a, a box here, which is uh, really uh, able to keep the flame inside. If you do that, uh, this box might have problem of structure. That means it could explode because the pressure will go up. So what you do, you put a small hole here so that the flame can go out. But the flame should go out, but a very limited amount of flame, because if you have a large flame coming out, then of course you will ignite the whole building and you're, you, it's lost. The other solution, of course, is to have a box where nothing can come out. <coughs> then the flame will start, it will go up, and then the problem qu quite often is that uh, the pressure will go to a large value and that the, the box itself will explode. And so it's a problem of design to be in between these two situations to make sure that uh, if you switch the light on and you have gas, then nothing explodes. Difficult combustion problem. Just a few words about deflagration de detonation. You hear that on TV. Basically, they, got, they, got, they get it wrong all the time. Uh, there are two main categories of flames. One is called deflagration. It is, I'm just here mentioning the name and the sound you will hear. Basically, for a deflagration, you will hear no sound. When I will ignite flames here, you will, you will have no, f no sound in this room. So, and the pressure in the flame like this is almost constant. The pressure in the burn gases, the pressure in the fresh gases, uh, it's the same. A detonation is a boom. So a detonation is basically a flame plus a shock, a shock wave. You have heard about shock waves in the course of uh, aerodynamics. Here, uh, you get a shock plus a flame pushing the shock. Uh, and of course, and that's not very pleasant, deflagration can become detonations. I will just now show you a few examples that's probably simpler to understand. So that's a building. Uh, again, this problem appears really in safety. So you take a building. Uh, it's not a real building, okay? It's for an experiment because uh, they put gas here with air, simulating, for example, a leak in the gas uh, 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 ducts. And then you go they're going to ignite it at one end. And here, the system will uh, lead to a, what we call a small flame or a deflagration. Okay, it's, it's not pleasant if you are here, okay? Uh, obviously, everyone, everyone in this building would be killed, but that's okay. I mean, it's not our problem. Our problem is the building itself, because imagine that this building can be, you know, 20 floors high. So our problem is to avoid that the whole building collapses. So if you have deflagration here, uh, you have basically a flame propagating from this side to this side, and it remains a deflagration. There is no shock. Another one. You can imagine here the size also of this experiment. This is real size, okay? So you can imagine the cost also. So this is cool. Uh, th just a deflagration. Let me show you a detonation. Detonation is more interesting. Now, the system is such that this deflagration will transition to detonation. And when it does, you have this kind of result. So 
so now everything, everyone is dead inside, but the, the whole structure is gone because the shock puts a lot of pressure on the walls, the walls go away, everything collapses, so everyone is dead there. Not only the people here, but everyone in the building. So being able to predict whether you go to detonation or not in a building is very important. You had an example not long ago in the oil industry. Uh, you remember, uh, as soon as you get an explosion in a, in a system like this, you get into a lot of problems. So we need to better combustion systems, more reliable, more efficient. The problem is that that's not, that's not so easy to do. Um, first thing is that the combustion technology today is already very complicated. I'm just going to show you a few examples here. That's a, a piston engine, four-stroke. Uh, so you get the piston, you get valves here for intake and uh, exhaust. I have brought actually uh, two of them so you can take a look at them. In the old days, all the students were able to work on their own engines. I know today very few of you have ever seen that. So that's a piston, uh, an example of piston engines. I broke them myself. Um, so those, uh, the technology here is extremely complicated. Uh, if you start working on a piston engine and you want to improve it, you will find out that many people have worked on that before you, and that's not so easy to do better. Just to give you an idea also of the complexity now, this is a four-cylinder uh, system with, uh, you can see the, the velocity field here at the intake and at the exhaust, and you can have an idea of how complicated it is to tune something like this. This, this used to be like an art, you know. Uh, now today it has to become a science to be able to get all the waves. You get a lot of acoustic waves here propagating everywhere. And so this is a very complicated field. So if you have an engine and you want to do better than what is existing, you need to do something really good. Now the problem, of, of course, also is that even if you are able today to build a better engine, um, the cost of replacing the existing technology by another technology is very, very large. Um, if you think, for example, of engines like this guy here, this is an engine for, for a boat. You can see the size of the guy here. Um, this kind of engines, if you come out with an ID and say, I can do better, well, the cost of replacing this engine by another one will be a very large cost. Furnaces, uh, you know, we need, we need to heat a lot of things for process. And of course, we do that with combustion, with flames, very long flames here, you can have things here of the 10 meters long, 20 meters long for the flame. And uh, optimizing this thing is extremely difficult, again, but the consumption of these things in terms of gas and in terms of pollution is huge. So again, here we have to do something to help. Gas turbines. Okay, I'm going to talk a lot about gas turbines today because they are very important. Gas turbines, uh, there's just no other way to propel, for example, an aircraft. Uh, you, cannot, you cannot use any kind of other energies to do that. So it's very important, and it's also very important for electricity. Electricity today is produced by many ways, uh, but typically when you talk about renewable energies like wind or sun, uh, there are problems with these systems. There are days where there is no wind or no sun. So what do you do when you install a system producing energy with wind or sun? You need to buy also a gas turbine, because the customers, they want electricity even if there is no sun or no wind especially in the summer, which is being now the first problem quite often is the summer because people use air conditioning. On a very hot day without wind, then uh, you will have to be able to do something. And so you will need a gas turbine. So gas turbines are found everywhere. You can find big gas turbines, small gas turbines. I'm going to show you a few examples of these animals. Uh, this is a, a, a gas turbine which has been very good for France. This is a CFM 56 if you're flying on an Airbus 320 or a Boeing 737. Certainly, you have been propelled by this engine before. Just to show you how these things work, you get a compressor here. The combustion chamber is this small thing here, and the turbine is behind it. Um, why do you need a compressor? You need a compressor, if you remember your courses on thermodynamics, because you are much more efficient if you burn at a high pressure. So the, here, the goal is to increase the pressure to 10, 20, 30 bars. You burn in the combustion chamber, and then after that, the turbine recovers the energy produced by combustion. But as you can see, this is an old engine. It's already quite complicated. Now, gas turbines come in all sizes and uh, powers. Here you get a reasonably big gas turbine. The power is of the order of 300 megawatts. So if you put three of them, you get a nuclear power plant. So it's a, it's a very large, very powerful system. 
At the other end, you have here uh, a very small gas turbine, about 50 watts. Uh, in between, you get all the range. So you can cover almost everything in this world with a gas turbine. Just an idea of what this is. This is what we call micro turbine, and some of you may actually work on that. There was a, a student from NSET working on that a few years ago. And uh, you can see inside here, you get also a compressor uh, turbine and a combustion chamber. Everything is very small. What is the objective here? Well, basically, and this is a very important statement here, if you burn 100 grams of methane, for example, CH4, it will produce much more energy than what you can have with 100 grams of an electric battery, typically 15 times. The first wonder of combustion is that with a limited amount, a limited weight, you can have a huge amount of energy. And uh, so what is the application here? Well, like always, like often, it's a military problem. You know that if you want to win a war, you need to be able to have the soldiers on the field for three days, typically. Four days, three days, well. Um, for the men, it's a problem because after two days, most men like to sleep, but you can, you can play games with that. You, know? you can inject them a few things which make them work for an extended amount of time. After that, they will die, but you don't care. Uh, the problem is that if they work and they have no uh, weapons, it won't work. Now, what do they need for the weapons? They need electricity. They need electricity for the GPS, for the radio, for the communication, for the weapon systems. And if they need to carry batteries on their back, it just won't do the job. They will have uh, like a, a car battery on their back. So the weight is a problem. So the military here are paying to see if they could, instead of giving them battery, they would just give them methane and burn that in a very small system which they could carry on their back, for example. And this would be, as you've seen, big like this. If this works for the military, then it will work for you on your cell phones. Instead of having batteries, you will have things like this. And uh, instead of having to plug your cell phone every two days or three days, you could just go like, to the shop to every one month or two months just to add methane into your, your cell phone. So this is another field of application of uh, combustion. Now, some people have fun also with exotic turbines. I've actually seen even a turbine on a, on a bicycle. Um, there's no useful application uh, of that, of course. An idea of how, uh, how people are working today on uh, computing those things. This is an example taken from Stanford, where they compute a complete gas turbine with the compressor here, the combustion chamber, and the turbine here. The, the progress in the simulation field in the last five to ten years has been so large that we start being able to do these computations. So uh, you can see here a result of the computation. Uh, to do that, you need a lot of processors. It's not something you do on your PC. You need a room filled with PCs, typically 10,000, 100,000, 1 million processors pretty soon working together to do this computation. Many of the students uh, doing thesis, for example, in the field of uh, combustion will actually do computations very similar to, to, to this one. Now, gas turbine combustion chamber, what does it look like? Well, you have an axis here. This is the axis of the chamber coming towards you with the turbine on this side and the, combustor on the compressor on the other side. Uh, here, this is the place where combustion takes place. This is what we call the combustion chamber. And you can see here a field of temperature, for example, in this zone here. These things here are called injectors or swirlers. I have brought one of them for you so you can take a look at it. Um, a swirler is a system which is there to mix the air and the fuel. You will see in this course basically combustion. To do combustion, you need to mix these two things, the air and the fuel. It's like cooking. You know, if you don't mix those things, it won't work. And you need to mix them fast. So this system, as you will see, is extremely complicated. The reason it's complicated is because you need to mix things very rapidly. And you need to avoid a lot of problems. I will mention a few in a few minutes. So this is also an expensive piece of uh, hardware. Don't break it. <coughs> so you, get, um, you have one here. In a system like this, you will have between 15 and 24 located everywhere here. So the, the air will come from this side, mix with the kerosene here, and burn in the chamber here and go to the turbine. Now, this thing you have in your hand, when it's burning, and you look at the flame here, this is what you would look like. It, it's like a lighter, except it's a much brighter flame. Uh, and then the, here the, the gases are cold. This is cold air. And here you get very hot gases. Typically in combustion, you will go to 2,000 to 2,500 Kelvin. Those are the typical temperature range you will have in an engine. 